well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and I'm here doing double feature with Michael Kester. Yeah, we're gonna do double feature for a change. Uh, Deep Red is one movie. What's yeah, the other movie we're doing? The Gore Gore Girls. Um, these are films that pet the white cat. Yeah, and we talked about that last episode. Yeah, is when films seem like they're a lot harder than yeah. they are. It's when you're scared by the. It's when you judge a film by its cover, <laughs> and you yeah, and your judgment is that the film is terrifyingly heady and difficult. But it turns out that somebody in the film that the villain turns around in a swivel chair and pets the white cat. Right. It's Does, a fucking cartoon. It's just a film. People. I mean, really speaking broader, that's what our entire show yep. is about. If these two idiots can understand movies, then really anyone can do it. These are two movies specifically uh, where the directors are talked about as if they're uh, you know, masters of their of craft. Cinema. And whether or not they are masters of their craft is irrelevant. But what goes along with that is that uh, their craft, um, the end result may be complicated and hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And it's really not. It's quite consumable. Sure. And we should make people very aware of that. What we didn't talk about last episode was misogyny. Oh, God. Yeah, you know what? We apologized in advance, and it wasn't good enough. Well, we'll we apologize. what happened is we apologized in advance for one show, but now we have to retroactively re-apologize because we didn't apologize for this show last week. That's probably fine. I think there's a... Uh, you know, I guess these are misogynistic. But, but these in a seem, different way. Yeah. These seem like the usual celebration sure. misogyny. These are grindhouse misogyny. Yeah. So where it's it, actually secretly celebrating. Right. Right. Where, uh, hey, aren't women great looking naked? That's and about right. It's fun. And I don't know if... I, it just feels wrong when Crank and Shoot 'em Up do it. Yeah, I don't want to get into a discussion about why they're different or what. It just feels wrong when Crank and Shoot 'em Up do it. You know what else feels wrong is spoiling films before people have seen them. Yeah, for 160 something odd weeks, we have been spoiling movies, except for those two crappy music box shows and The Year End, which I don't know why anyone listens to. But uh, listen to this show, but not if you've not seen the movies, yeah. I suppose. Well, especially because these are kind of these are kind of murder mystery Scooby Doo esque. They are. There's actually part of the film is not knowing how it's going to end. Whereas people like you and myself consider weird things trailers. Spoilers. Yeah, I mean the, the weird things that are called spoilers are trailers. I mean details from the movie. Yeah. I don't. I I really don't even want to know what city the third act takes yep. place in. But most people don't want to know who done it. I think that's fair. Yeah. That's probably what I care about least in the yeah. movie. But that's what most people don't want to know. And you're going to find that out, uh, maybe, in this episode. Now, if you don't want Double to, Feature. I suppose you could just chapter over all the way to the end and find out what we're doing next week. You could use the chapters. You could uh, also use the timestamps, which you'll find in the lyric section and on the great Double Feature website at DoubleFeatureShow.com. Uh, double you remember when we used to talk about donations every week and how grating that was on your ears? Now yeah. I'm just going to mention the website every fucking week, yeah. and you're going to wish I asked for money. You're going to wish, beg for money. In us fact, to ask if, you, money. if you send us a fixed amount of money that we are setting in our brains right now, yeah. uh, we will stop talking about the website. Oh, good. I like this. Hold the listener's ears ransom. Um, Deep Red is going to be the first movie, mm -hmm. and I before we we're not there yet. We mm -hmm. haven't chaptered. Yep. Don't don't skip yet. There are sections that are inexplicably in Italian. Yes, and that's not just your copy of the movie. Uh -huh. You need subtitles. Okay, the, there was we watched a little bit of the film without subtitles because yep. I forgot. Yeah, I watched all of my Argento in pretty much one week of my life. Uh huh. A bad idea. Yeah, I have some trouble telling the films apart. Sure, it was really. I wish I spaced that out more. I didn't remember we needed subtitles. That's okay. Thankfully, I literally left my apartment, ran to a neighbor, got subtitles from her, and then injected them mm -hmm. into our copy. Technical wizardry. Now, you may also notice that in a standard whodunit murder mystery fashion, it sounds like a rainy storm is going on in our studio. That's intentional. <laughs> right. That's part of, we're trying to set the mood. We've been getting together every day this week, attempting to record, and it's never been noisy enough outside. Uh huh. Yeah, we've so, been, we've we've planned it 
We've planned it for a day that there is a massive storm in Chicago. Uh, it took me longer to get here than ever because every, literally every traffic light in the city is out. Great. If these shows sound like crap this year, we've just given up at the show sounding good. Mm-hmm. I keep, you know, I used to come on here all the time and say, we need more money to buy studio padding and all this great stuff. And everybody would email us and say, what are you talking about? Your shows sound great. This so, is what you get for your compliments, bastards. What you should have said is, here's $20. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get into the first movie, which is called Deep Red, or uh, I think it's Profondo Rososo. Profondo Rosso. Is that what? I think I, that's what I it was. I don't know Italian. Um, Not even a little Italian. So it's Italian because it's Argento. Yes. So what did we learn about Argento last time? Do you remember any of that? Psychic animals. Psychic animals. Good. Good. We'll revisit that. I know Suspiria tends to have strong female leads, so this is different. Okay. Like, I've seen... The only two real Argentos I've seen prior to Deep Red was Phenomena, mm-hmm. a.k.a. Creepers. Right. And Suspiria, which is, I'm going to say, his most famous... I'll agree. ...at least cultish film. And both of them have strong female leads. This one, not so much. But yeah. we do get Dil Dano in the lead. <laughs> we do. Yeah, and also there is, uh, there is some important bits of feminism in here. Beyond, you know, uh, the usual Argento woman fighting the whatever thing. Yeah. Um, I think we have some... Fe- this is... By the way, you if you chaptered around too much, you have chaptered into Deep Red right now and not even knowing you were doing it. I'm about to drop the first Deep Red spoiler, so chapter away once again. Okay. The, the killer at the end is a woman. Yes, right? that's true. Um, there's also uh, some interesting notes about homosexuality. There is, uh, which I don't know if that necessarily falls into feminism, but it's at least part of that sure. uh, open-minded, almost uh, cinematic activism mm-hmm. that we see a lot when we talk about you know stuff from the Grindhouse era, stuff from the 60s and 70s. There's also some insightful notes about stabbing small lizards. That's strangely in there, too. Probably, no, I'm going to say definitely not related to feminism. But they are probably psychic lizards. We can definitely safely assume that the lizards are psychic. Ghana's a much more interesting lead, uh, or, or I guess, um, with the Watson of this. Film. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, what the second to our detective, uh-huh. right? The um, the partner. What do you call the person who helps out the detective? Isn't there a term for that? Robin. Once again, double feature. Not a place to go for information. <laughs> Not a place to go at all. Steer away. Um, when we get to Gorgor Girls, uh-huh. we're going to see the female lead is more of a floozy. We're also going to see a lot stronger of a Sherlock Holmes character. <laughs> we certainly are. Yeah, we definitely are. This is really the more subtle of it. Yeah. Who would have ever thought? They're, that's how you know you're in petting white cat territory. Yeah, it's true. So our leading lady here is not only the smarter of the two in the pairs today, but I mean, she challenges him to arm wrestling. There's, yeah, that's true. There's some serious notes in here. I think she is well representing. If Argento isn't, she is well representing the, the strong female, female persuasion. Sure. Right? And, uh, and there's some back and forth between her and the lead over, mm-hmm. you know, what's different between men and women yeah. or whatever. And at least having that dialogue is, I mean, when we saw Crank and Shoot Him Up last yeah. week, by comparison, almost every film sure. will seem feministic. Well, also, it kind of, that kind of dialogue is, is one thing that this film does that's almost surprising. It's really one of the more screaming pet the white cat moments is the the tone of humor that the film has. Mm -hmm. There are moments where it's very serious, very scary, very dark, very woman gets her head impaled on glass. Sure, sure. There are also moments where David Hemmings has to sit in a a silly car. Sure, yeah. And he has to be in an uncomfortable seat, and you barely see over what should be in my head. I just, in my head, he has a mustache because Mm -hmm. of Dil Dano from Barbarella. Right. But I guess in this film, he has no mustache. But you barely see his face because he has to sit in the funny car. Yeah. And that kind of awareness of humor is a very, very clear indication that we were too scared of Dario Argento. And this is certainly humor not found in his other films. I mean, I think this one stands out uh, the most for having only these, you know, what are in his other movies, just brief moments of Uh humor. Here, that's really what gives the movie its character. It's true. It's these personalities you'd like to be around, uh, solving this mystery together while they're doing these uh, kind of quirky things. I mean, mm-hmm. the low seat is, you know, is a go-to for that. But even the conversation that they have where he's talking to her next to the steamer, that just seems to go on almost like a Three Stooges yeah, routine. Yeah, true. Getting out of the roof of the car seems yeah. like it should be Benny Hill tape sped. Yeah. I mean, the entire thing, it just... 
It gives it a more character, and I really that's that's why I wanted to do this one first. Sure. It also gives it another half hour. It certainly does. It pads it out nicely. And so that's one of the things that's uh, maybe a bit unlike Argento or informs you more about his other films. Mm-hmm. I think another thing that's that's very Argento about this is Goblin, which we talked yeah, about sure. you know, in uh, in the last film we did. Yeah, and and again, I know I keep bringing up Suspiria, but I will I'll warn you for the rest of uh, for the rest of this chapter. Suspiria is really my strongest knowledge of Dario sure, Argento. Sure. Go back. I to really it, it's fine. enjoyed Suspiria and the soundtrack. Is they reuse part of the soundtrack, or at Do least they, it, I part think it of the song? Vaguely like it. I don't know. Is it the same? They one? They reuse part of the song. I'm going to hold you to that. It may not. It may be a version of it. It okay. may be a slightly different arrangement. But the song Suspiria does resurface in here, minus minus the didgeridoo. Right. Okay. I like how you left yourself a tiny escape for when people email us and say it's not the same goddamn song. Uh, the Goblin ass kicking on the case music is incredible. Yep. It's, uh, you know... It's It's where you don't want to die. Yeah, right. Yeah, if that song kicked in during my death scene, I would be pissed. It sounds like there's a bunch of great stuff that's going to happen directly after we get past this momentary... It sounds like the setup to a a great film, and it just happens over and over. That fucking... uh, That wonky bass. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, it's great. And, you know, there's there's few things I have seen from horror directors. It, It borders on Eli Roth. Uh, sex and violence uh-huh. that are as effective a combination as goblin and macro shots of toys. Yeah, that it's so effective. I don't even question why it's in the film. Yeah, well, I my my only my only thought, and this is just a weird thing I have with film, where mm. I see something and in my head I think they wanted that to be the opening credits. Sure, yeah. but for some reason decided against it. That's how I felt about the creepy toys and the goblin. Perhaps too good is why they yeah. perhaps they thought, "Eh, I'm going to stick this That's in my true. film where I need Sometimes you know, I think that about this. sometimes I think that about why there isn't stuff at the end of credits in films. Sure. I see a scene go, "That was an end of credit film that ended up looking too good." Too much work put into it. We need sure. people are going to leave by now. We need to inject That's it That's kind of actual... how I felt about uh the X-Men film. The yeah, new one. right. If we could bring this down just a notch here, when you're considering a lot of these classic horror films, the easy identifier to go to, if you walk in on somebody else watching uh, a horror film and you need to pick out, is it your Argento or your maybe your Mike or uh-huh. your Herschel Gordon-Lewis, the color of the blood is yeah. strangely a great indicator of this. Yeah, it's true. And you'll see this watching these two films back to back because it almost appears as if it's a different liquid coming out of uh you know people's veins the, with the argento stuff it tends to be more on the orange side yeah you know the consistency is a lot different and we'll get into the uh, the raspberry jam that is for yeah. gordon lewis in just a moment but visually i find argento's kills uh, besides the something as simple as the color of the blood to be a bit more it it seems weird to say intense with what we're sure. going to talk about theatrical with the, maybe with the gorgo girls they're uh maybe even violence yeah. not the right word so much as just painful horrifying a yeah. uh, yeah. little fucked up yeah um you know if we ever get into covering something like opera or a lot of these kills they just seem like things you would not want to go through uh-huh. they are uh so maybe that makes them more you serious you wouldn't want to die yeah i was trying not to boil it down to that you know what it is when you think about worse ways to die yeah i mean these you think are... about worse ways to die you wade through the hatchet films yeah, and right. then shortly down the list of uh after Adam Green and a few others, you come to Dario Argento. Yeah, you know, we'll never get a, a better point of comparison than... Uh, I'm, j- I'm just going to fucking ruin this. Uh, this is just going to happen. Uh, running over the head. Yeah. And, um... <laughs> Whoops. You know what? I mean, if you watch the two movies, you got it. Other Somebody's head gets run over yeah. strangely in both of these yeah. films. That was unintentional. I don't know how that happened. Something in my subconscious probably made me pair these for that uh-huh. stupid, stupid reason. Something just went through your mind. Was but, it a tire? And we'll, uh, again, I'm going to shelve this a bit for Herschel Gordon Lewis, but uh, you don't get a better sense of what I'm trying to say here with my mm-hmm. awful use of the English language than seeing a head run over in a Herschel Gordon Lewis movie where it's momentary and awkward and uh, you're not really sure what you just saw. Uh-huh. And then seeing it in an Argento movie where someone gets drugged through the streets yeah. painfully before their head is inevitably smashed. The one other thing that, that really reminds me of Argento here is part of this detective story. 
is the the tenebrae sort of uh, investigation Mm -hmm. that happens. And you see that a few other places in Argento's work, and we almost saw that a little bit in Creeper. I mean, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, 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 for sure. When we watched uh, Phenomena, I don't know why we ever use Creepers. I don't either. I think it's kind of a joke. I think nobody ever called this movie Creepers. One guy who designed cover art at some point. Yeah. There was definitely an investigation there, although by some psychic bees or whatever. Well, it was a psychic bee, Dr. Loomis, and a monkey, I think, were the investigators, the the chief (laughs) investigators in the Phenomena case. It is so, so strange, Argento's fascination with psychic animals. I just don't, we covered it enough on Phenomena, but they make a point of bringing it up for basically no reason in the beginning, before they kill off the psychic. Yeah, they kill the psychic. This would have been a much different movie had they not just killed off the psychic. And the killer herself is a woman. The Mm -hmm. mere fact that we never would have guessed that because she's a woman says as much about feminism as anything I could say about that choice. Well, and that's one of the things that's really kind of surprising about this film is it seems like the basic whodunit outline. It seems like the whole time you're watching it, it's red herringing you to pick one guy, which leads you to believe that it's not going to be this person. It'll be this person. And I know it's going to be this person. But by the end, I was legitimately surprised and, furthermore, did not feel cheated. Those are two things that rarely go hand-in-hand in in a whodunit film, (laughs) Jason 5. Especially with you. I think it's usually one or the other. Yeah, either I see it coming or I feel cheated. One of the great things about not feeling cheated with that, you know, when we talk about these films, you can can watch again and if they hold up or they make any sense Mm -hmm. or they just uh, do that thing High Tension did. When you see this movie again a second time, it is so fucking obvious that there is a woman standing in a mirror. So obvious. You know, they make this big deal about where did that other painting go or what was that about? Yeah. And then they kind of, you know, just brush it under the rug. When I saw this again, I was like, oh, they're showing us the killer right there. It's yeah. her standing in the mirror. And the fact that they can plant that in there in such a way where just like our protagonist, you don't see it the first time. Yeah. But you believe the end Scooby-Doo moment where, yeah. oh, isn't it so obvious? It was right under our noses the entire time. That's a hard moment to pull off. Yeah, it is. That's a very difficult thing to, to effectively, you know, really make come through in your film. And I think it works. Absolutely. It does. It really does. So credit to the movie for that. Credit to the movie for the tension it builds, which is great. Man, the scene uh, where the killer is in his apartment and he's playing piano. Yeah. And there's tension and the phone. Well done. Seriously. Amazing. You know, another scene when the investigator is killed. And the movie is seriously just, you know, upped its game. And the doors fly open. And uh, the mechanical doll comes in. It looks like a a ventriloquist. Looks like something out of the Saw films. It is creepy as a motherfucker. I cannot believe how effective that uh that scene is we really should have done this before the game because we're always looking for reasons to pad another two or three minutes into that episode ah this would have been perfect how fucking great what about that scene is so it is so amazing right it is it's 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 so brief why is it so good i think it's because you're terrified that a killer is going to come through and kill him and then it turns out to be a doll and the only thing you can think of is I wish that were a killer because I don't know what that thing's going to do. It's the unknown. Yeah. I think that's definitely what it is. You don't know how it's coming towards him or sure. why. And you don't know what how it's going to do. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Is it going to injure you? Uh it's just it's so unexpected. Does it explode? Does it explode, right? What is this going to do to uh to kill or maim me? You find uh, a doll hanging, uh, suspended from the ceiling, you know, by a noose. Uh, Why is it there? What does it mean? These are really the moments. While the films are fine and I'm having a a wonderful, wonderful time with them, they get to these moments like this, and I start to think, okay, these are the notable moments. These are the things, you know, to talk about icons, to talk about things you will remember for fucking ever, Mm -hmm. the, uh, the images of the movie that stick with you. These are really the effective moments that are uh, created like uh, like few other people yeah. can make them. You know, there was, there was something just for my own amusement that I'd like to ask you about. I felt really thrown off when I first saw this um, after he discovers the secret room and he gets hit. The very next shot, doesn't that seem to reveal our female lead as the killer? Sure, yeah, it definitely you looks like... You do get like, that sense, right? Oh, yeah. 
Is that just us? Is that intentional? I don't know. I think it's intentional. Well, the whole time you're basically watching for people with eyeliner. Sure. Yeah. The eyeliner is also trying to be a red herring here. So that, that's definitely It's true. not trying to be a red herring. It's just a clue that you always misconstrue. Okay. Yeah. No, I guess that's true. I guess that's absolutely true. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. It's just because she, man, you're right. It's so intentional uh, from the movie's part. I didn't even think about that. Outside of that, though, all it does is it accomplishes this by presenting this scene to you without context, so you feel like it's a clue. Right. You see this eyeliner, and so you assume, oh, this must be a, a clue. So I always, I never even put that together. Yeah. I just thought, up oh, the movie's presenting us a shot of eyeliner for no reason, which it's totally allowed to do. You can do that in a film. Sure. And we just go, well, what is this clue? Does mm-hmm. this inform uh, more about our, you know, more about our killer? You want to talk about under your nose the whole time. <laughs> we get a sleepaway camp-esque uh, flashback yeah, we of do. early childhood issues. It's really creepy. And you know what's great is it, it really pulled off this sort of, it's not a flying tom-tom. It's more bookends, I guess. Mm-hmm. But this moment where you think to yourself, oh, yeah, I remember that from the beginning yeah. of the movie. You have a, a Black Christmas sort of, I don't know if that's just the, the time that makes me feel that, uh, sort of kill yeah. in here in the very beginning. A uh, very artfully shot, incredibly theatrical kill with silhouetting and shadowing and you know this, this bloody knife. And when we come back to it, in the end, you once again, it does this effective thing of making you feel like an idiot for having the pieces in front of you. Right. Although I don't know if that's something that even if I were to pause it before a reveal and say, okay, think back to the beginning of the movie. Do you remember anything? I'm not sure that actually tells us anything. No, I don't know if it does either. I think just coming back to it gives us that false sense yeah, of we missed something. I knew something. it the whole time. Yeah, and we really should have been watching more carefully. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I've had enough Italy, and I'm really kind of itching to get back home. Yeah, this is amazing when this just seems to happen all the time. We feel like Chicago is never in films, Mm -hmm. ever in films. And we also feel like there's not enough nudity in films. Very true. However, this year on Double Feature, we're really just hitting the staples over and over. Fantastic. Herschel Gordon-Lewis is an interesting guy. He's the the author of The Businessman's Guide to Advertising and Sales Promotion. Sure, sure. Familiar. I guess he's actually written a lot of books. He grew up in Evanston, which... I mean, it's near Chicago. Oh, yeah. Well, it's the end of the red line. Probably more important for being um, the home of Mean Girls. Yes, when we, it's true. <laughs> when we talked about that. And he's got a degree in journalism. I mean, this is, this is a guy who doesn't seem to do films first. And as he seems to announce with pride at the end, right. the movie is over. I think he knew he made bad films. You know, I, I get this sense that this is somebody probably between Russ Meyer and um, Ed Wood. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Somebody who is very enthusiastic about what he's doing uh, and maybe just a little bit uh, more aware than, than either of them were. We talked about Blood Feast a tiny bit on the Music Box show, uh-huh. but we never really uh, covered Herschel Garden Lewis. Yeah, you know, we also in, in, talked about him a little bit when we did Wizard of Gore with that crazy guy. Yeah, that's true. Not right. Crispin Glover. Yeah, we, uh, Jeremy Casson. We talked about Herschel Gordon Lewis with Jeremy Casson, you know, as a name, right? As somebody unapproachable. I feel like we're just now starting talking about him, though. Mm-hmm. And it's a strange place because this is really his last film until he did Blood Feast 2. Right, which was it, what, last year, two years ago? He, it, it was a few years ago, yeah. But I mean, there's a, you know, a 30-year gap or mm-hmm. something in there. So what was he doing in the meantime? Well, so this is kind of weird. He... It seems like he retired from film. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Came out of retirement to do Blood Feast 2, which had John Waters. And something called The Uh Oh Show, which Uh I have not seen. Okay. But is apparently about a game show where when you get an answer wrong, you get a limb removed. Wow. Yeah, something I need to see as soon as we're done recording today. He got out of film and he kind of went back into marketing, into uh, sales things, into copyright law. And that's a very... I mean, it makes sense when you think about it, mm-hmm. but to think that Herschel Gordon Lewis, the first thing he knew was copyright and marketing, and the second thing he knew was, you know, filmmaking, and mm-hmm. it was just his hobby. It right. certainly excuses his films a bit more. It does, if, if they need an excuse. Well, the reason I think we're doing Gorgor Girls, you know, even though it's his last film before this huge break, right. 
is because the production values are about as high as they're going to get it's true. out of one of the movies of that era, mm-hmm. uh, one of his movies of that era. They're on par with, you know, on his best day, they're on par with something out of Russ Meyer's Up. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say Up, yeah. And that's one of the things that makes these midnight movies, that makes them the, the kind of thing that would show up at the music box, is these low production values. Yep. You know, when we talked about what gave the Argento stuff its own kind of class and character, part of the low budget and barely held together, and I could almost have done this in my backyard with my friends, nature of this, that's definitely one component to the name Mm -hmm. Herschel Gordon Lewis. I think the other thing is the creation of the splatter film. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that the name splatter film (laughs) Sure. Well, sure, even that. That was something I think Romero called called the genre kind of splatter films. Or really the gore film. Yeah. You know? We're always hesitant to point somebody out as the first person who ever did. To do did anything. Whatever. Because they're probably not. Uh, no idea is original and we could Because go back we don't as, watch black and white silent films is why. That could be it. It could be that. Or you could... I mean, I think even on year 25 when we get into black and white silent films, we'll find that people will email us and say... You know, those things Fritz Lang did were actually done in theater in China sure. 21 centuries earlier. You're always going to find an earlier source. But this is part of the popularization. Yeah, and absolutely. This is, this is certainly a huge uh, bullet point uh, looking back in that timeline. Mm-hmm. When you consider more modern films, I mean, everything from Cannibal Holocaust to Splat Pack to French New Extremism to, to fucking Rambo 4. Yeah. I mean, a ton of the stuff we've covered... That was a good list. It's not hard because you look back through movies we've done and any of them that have gore in them, a heavy degree of gore, you can make this argument even for, uh, for films outside of the genre. Yeah. You know, when you start to get outside into things like Spaghetti Western, although mm-hmm. that's still kind of exploitative, war films, a lot of yeah. these uh, different films that use uh, Rambo. I mean, I guess Rambo was a good example. Because that felt gory, given where we put it on the show and stuck it with 300. But that itself is not, uh, it's not a splat pack mm. kind of film. It feels like it is. Yeah. And that comes from the old Herschel Gordon Lewis stuff. So you make these things for cheap. He paid for them using money from his Chicago-based advertising firm. Okay. And so here we have a movie set in Chicago. Starring Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about Abraham Gentry uh-huh. a little bit. This guy's supposed to be a playboy, right? Okay. But he lives in a tiny, crappy apartment. Yeah, he does. You know, when our lead, uh, when they're first introduced, uh, Amy Farrell, who's Nancy in the movie, mm-hmm. ridiculously attractive. When I get that final strip show, I mean, I almost feel a little cheated. Do you yeah. feel cheated by that? Oh, yeah. Stunt boobs. It, <laughs> yeah. Should he use some stunt boobs? It, it could learn a thing or two from Crank. Were yeah. those stunt boobs in Crank? I'm going with yes. Just bring the misogyny right back. Thanks, double feature. Thanks, stunt boobs. Stunt boob, please. It's rare that you only get one in a film. They've shown us so many naked women. Oh, we really can't complain at that point. But I mean... Oh, you, we can always complain. You want what you can't have. And what I want is Amy Farrell naked. And I'm, I'm a little upset that yeah. if I could get anybody naked in the film... It couldn't be Amy Abraham, Farrell. I'm sorry. So he lives in this tiny, crappy apartment, which every time I see this movie is fucking hilarious yeah. to me. They walk in, and it's a hallway, and it's basically a studio apartment. Yeah. But he's supposed to be this exquisite guy. He dresses in these nice suits, the way he talks. Sure. I also don't believe that he likes women. No, I don't. I'm Not for a second. Yeah, I'm not even sure he's... I'm, I'm pretty sure he's a virgin, but probably <laughs> right. a gay virgin. And it's funny to even complain about nudity in this film because the light and the camera work is so terrible. It's true. So terrible. It's, it's under or overexposed in every scene. It may even somehow be both. Under, I was just going to say that. Seriously. Under and overexposed. Somehow. I don't know. The, the use of a single... When I talk about David Fincher movies, I'll mention spotlighting just as you know, a tiny pool of light. This is spotlighting. It's literally, hey, let's light our set yeah. using a real spotlight. And the, the camera and the, the development of the film, everything about it is so crappy. I'm not even sure. I feel like this would be safe on PBS at yeah. 3 in the afternoon. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's almost to that point where sometimes you're watching nudity in a film, and if it's done extremely well, uh, you know, to where it's extremely graphic, Mm-hmm. Not to always say those are the same thing, sure. but 
if you've somehow managed to pull this off, I have seen nudity in the film. I feel uncomfortable even watching with you. Yeah. I feel uncomfortable telling other people. Maybe right. Russ Myers up was a good example yeah, of that. Yeah, that's a great example. Uh, I feel uncomfortable around anyone watching, and I am one half of the people on this show who constantly tell our listeners to send us naked pictures. Right. Which, by the way, may also fall in that category sometimes. Of being uncomfortable? Yeah. It's oh, whatever. A, in this movie, by contrast, it almost feels like they're wearing body paint because they are so washed out. And that's part of the style. Yeah, That's is. part of when you think back to a Herschel Gordon Lewis movie or you try and copy that look. That's what you'd be doing. But you see these strip scenes, which I'm also convinced that Herschel Gordon Lewis does not know how to shoot a naked woman. I'm pretty sure Herschel Gordon Lewis, uh, by his own admission, uh, doesn't really know what he's doing. The girls' bodies, I mean, they're already all detailless white figures. Sure. Um, mannequins. Mm -hmm. But the poor composition is, I suppose it's surprising for Herschel Gordon Lewis, but in a way it makes sense. It feels more like, maybe because I'm used to the Russ Meyer stuff. Yeah. I'm used to these nudie films that, you know, Meyer we think of as, as the king of that stuff and sure. are you to add a, a little bit of gore you sure. suddenly start getting the Herschel Gordon Lewis stuff well when we get into when we get into uh, step two of our Rocky process I think we'll have a lot we'll have a lot to talk about on that front as well do you oh yes interesting more nudity to look forward to just keep enticing uh, the listeners with naked people Russ Meyer was a photographer yeah. I mean, there was a guy, we talked about the stuff he did in World War II and the stuff he did for, I think it was Penthouse or Playboy, one of the early magazines, right? Mm -hmm. He knew how to compose a shot and operate a camera. He knew technically what he was doing. Whereas what you see out of Herschel Gordon Lewis kind of looks like if you gave a horny 13-year-old a camera, what he would try to do sure. to film the bodies. Right. You know, it's moving around a mm -hmm. lot. It kind of stays on, it's this awkward area you're much more of an ass guy than yeah, I am. Yeah, that's true. Just not the parts of the female body I care about. Uh-huh. But I feel like these aren't... This isn't an ass shot like we got in Cabin Fever. Oh, Cabin this Fever isn't, ass shot. This isn't a, a glorious pedestal this is being mm -hmm. placed upon. It's more of an awkward back of the thigh kind of shot. Yeah, it's true. But the one thing that Herschel Gordon Lewis is undisputably one of the masters of is the grossest fucking digging your hands through... Sure chicken gizzards to the point where you're watching disgusting inner to play right and you don't even know what you're supposed to be seeing <laughs> right. you just want to puke yeah it's this sort of i mean that's how he's accomplishing the gore it seems like it's a paper mache head and just pounds of of jelly and yeah and people are digging through it and it is, it's to the point where you don't know what you're looking at. Yeah, right. You've lost contact. You've <laughs> sure. lost context. Right. And you're just seeing this disgusting thing. And the fact that the camera's fixed and won't turn away makes it lets you know you're supposed to be uncomfortable. Right. And so you are. At a bowl of jelly and a, a fake face. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, crushing the faces in this movie is almost as good as crushing the melons in it's this true. movie. I love the fruit crushing guy. For no reason, fruit, I, where do you come down? Not that anyone gives a shit, but I'm going to uh -huh. ask you just to entertain this momentarily. Yeah. Where's the mystery here for you? Do you have any idea what's going on? Let's play the who done it for a second. Yeah. Well, I you is know, it the fruit crush guy? I mean, it, who, who yeah, did you have? Who did you have fingered for this crime? Pretty. I think I had him. I I didn't really care. Right. Um. I was. That's, that's why I said my that. interest was in other places, but I figured it was him just because he was somebody that I wasn't paying attention to. Right. Right. And it seems so obvious, and you don't know. That's how you completely disarm people. Yeah. You don't know where Herschel Gordon Lewis is coming from. You don't know if he's this guy who's making films on the weekend, or if he has any clue what he's doing. Right. We'll hold him up now as a champion for how far you know he's brought us, and the bizarre, you know, incredible pieces of stand on their own filmmaking that we're looking at yeah, here. And burn victim murders. You just don't know though if when he's writing a story like this. We'll start to see some of the similarities between his other story. Yeah. We even did it in Blood Feast. I mean, a lot of times it's the same sort of reoccurring story. And I just don't know how to call this. And so I don't know if it's the melon guy. The last person I suspect is really the woman. Yeah. And sure enough, she's doing the ass tenderizing. Yeah, it's true. She's frying the faces. And frying the faces. Yeah, there's so many interesting scenes of gore in here. The one that gets picked out all the time is the, the face iron and the... Um, the nipple milk. Yeah. 
where yeah, it's, weird. it seems like it's chocolate milk out of one yep. nipple. It's often called, you know, the chocolate milk shot or whatever. That's how people refer to it. But I'm not sure if it's supposed to look like chocolate yeah. milk or not. If that's part of his gag or if the lighting on that side of the frame just sucks. <laughs> it's impossible to get a good enough print of this film to have any clue. What, this is a movie oh, that... I don't know. I think, I think the definition of good enough is debatable. <laughs> well, I think we, there are people out there, myself included, that want it to look like chocolate milk. No, I agree. I 100% agree with you. But if I'm going to try and answer some of these unsolved questions, Mm -hmm. I need a clearer print of this movie to have any clue what's going on. I feel like uh, we watched the the movie on a a fairly decent size television, high definition, all that great stuff. Mm -hmm. High definition as you can really get out of this. I feel like if we watched it on a 13-inch TV, if we watched it on the Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer TV, TV, we may have... Uh, understood a little bit more. Or maybe if you watch it and squint, it makes a yeah. little more sense. Or if you watch it when it came out and everything looked that shitty and oh, your God. eyes were accustomed to, to no detail. So Marlene falls, and uh, you're not even really sure she fell off of a balcony. Because well, she didn't. She walked out a door and then tripped. Yeah, you, they they kind of point out that she did it, and you're like, oh, well, she's boned. And then she walks out, and you're like, well, I guess she got away. <laughs> right. And then in about a second and a half scene... A uh, truck runs over her face, and I feel like I've seen this before. Uh, yeah, and the detective goes, well, she always did have a truck running over her face. And you sure, get this the very Sherlock Holmes reveal where he explains, this is how I knew it all along, and he recaps and goes through. I, I don't know how familiar you are with Sherlock Holmes. Uh, not at all. But this is verbatim. Sherlock Holmes' smarter brother. The yeah. adventure. Adventure right. of Sherlock, I'll never know. But this is verbatim how Sherlock Holmes stories end. He wins, and then there's a gloat session where he explains to Watson how he knew all along and right, how Watson right. was being strung along the whole time, but Sherlock Holmes was on top of things. And then we have Abraham Gentry turn away the hot piece of ass and go back. And in. break the fourth wall. For, that's true. What is it, the third or fourth time in the film? Uh, I think that's the third. You know, I've never known. Maybe I'm more conscious of More it times I'm, than M. I'm watching it with you, and we had this uh, fair debate about this on M. But uh, two Fritz Lang references in the Dario Argento, Herschel Gordon Lewis episode. Not sure why that's necessary. But so maybe I'm more aware of it as I'm watching it with you for the first time. And, uh, and I always remember the ending, the pull down, the curtain, <laughs> versus yep. the weird outs with pride, the movie. That's really the best way to, I think that's how I'm going to end my films. We announce with pride, this movie is over. How can you be mad at the film after yeah, that? Yeah, you can't. But previous to that, uh, there's there's at least once where he definitely breaks the fourth wall. Mm-hmm. And then there's once where he breaks the fourth wall uh, briefly before this in a struggle. Yeah. So you're not really... It, it almost doesn't seem like it should count as breaking the fourth wall because that implies there's an audience. Right. You know I mean? Right. It seems like he's actually just talking to Herschel Gordon Lewis as they're making this film. And ultimately that's uh, that's one of the characteristics, I feel, about uh, the Gordon Lewis stuff. It's this feeling that you are there with them making this crappy three people on the set film. Sure, and I love it. You I really do you love it. You can't top that. So there's this website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. Uh-huh. And on the website, we have Bad Cat. Right? We do. Oh, and yeah. Bad Cat has its own portal now, its own page that you can go. You can read a little bit about Bad Cat in case you don't know why you that's need on to there. Know the background of Bad Cat, but it's actually on the toolbar or whatever at the yeah. top of the site, right next to list of films from A to Z. Sure, you have Bad Cat as if that's an equally important part. It's a, it's, of double it's a feature. very very necessary utility. You of, didn't uh, need it this feature. week, but you may eventually need Bad Cat coming up. What are we doing next time on the show? Double feature show at gmail.com. What are we doing next time on the show? Uh, next time we're going to do some... Uh, okay, this is weird. We're going to do a Tarantino Rodriguez double pair up on double feature. And one of these has to be Grindhouse, right? Because Tarantino yeah, no, and Rodriguez Yeah, actually they're made, both Grindhouse. No, what but I mean the film, the, the 2007 film Grindhouse. Yes, they're both Grindhouse. No, the 2007 film. There was a film <laughs> called... Do you remember when Planet Terror and Death Proof came in the same box? No. See, that's what always that's what always phases me. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do the 
Tarantino Rodriguez joint from Dust Till Dawn and the uh, Tarantino Rodriguez joint Four Rooms. Excellent. So we're going to do two movies, both of which have some element of Tarantino and Rodriguez in them. Absolutely. Yeah, we uh, we couldn't do it in the beginning of the year to hit the year off because we had way too much other stuff to tackle. Mm -hmm. But it's been a long time. I mean, we really haven't done this since Pulp Fiction and Sin City. We've been nice. And this is kind of a, a real weird one that we need to get back to. So I'm um, going to ruin the ending. Great. And I'm excited to watch more fucking film. Bye.